Dear colleagues, I have a great honor to introduce two very special guests today, Dr. Leroy Hood and uh, Dr. Jennifer Lovejoy. The first speaker of this special seminar today is Dr. Leroy Hood. He is a, a world-renowned scientist who in the year 2000 co-founded the Institute for Systems Biology based in downtown Seattle, I think uh, just a few blocks from Space Needle. Uh, Dr. Hood served as its first president from 2000 to 2017 and is a professor and chief strategy officer. Dr. Hood is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine. Of the more than 6,000 scientists worldwide who belong to the one or more of these academies, Dr. Hood is one of only 20 people elected to all three. Dr. Hood received his MD degree from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and his PhD in biochemistry from Caltech. Dr. Hood was a faculty member at Caltech from 1967 to 1992, serving for 10 years as the chair of biology. During this period, he and his colleagues developed four sequencer and synthesizer instruments that paved the way for the human genome projects successful and mapping and understanding of the human genome. Dr. Hood is currently carrying out studies, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, cancer, and wellness. He is pioneering a one million patient genome phenome project. He has played a role in founding 15 biotech companies, including Amgen, Applied Biosystems, Aerivale, and Nanostring. And he has co-authored textbooks in biochemistry, immunology, molecular biology, genetics, and systems biology. He has published more than 850 peer-reviewed articles and holds numerous patents. Today, the title of Dr. Hood's presentation is Radical Health, the largest paradigm shift in medicine ever. So Dr. Hood, welcome. The floor is now yours. Well, it's, uh, is this on? Yes. You can hear. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about uh, an aspect of my career that's evolved over the last uh, 50 or 60 years. And that's the idea of human health and what the next big step is. I founded a nonprofit company three years ago called Phenome Health. And its mission, actually, is to catalyze this very large paradigm change that's mentioned in the title. And the change is a very simple one. It's the argument that we want to transfer from a healthcare that's oriented toward disease to one that's focused around wellness and prevention. And to affect this transformation will require science, and technology, and psychology, and sociology, and 
and an enormous amount of education about a different worldview of health, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Our approach to catalyzing this change is the idea that it should be data-driven for each individual, and you should use the data of the individual to assess, A, the status of that individual's health, B, their projected health trajectory if no changes are made, and see what you need to do to optimize that uh, trajectory. And we'll tell you just how we're thinking about going about that. I remember as a young assistant professor at Caltech in 1970, uh, as young assistant professors do, thinking about what did I want to do now that I'd grown up and I had my own career and was going to be a professor. And I would really decided human biology was what I wanted to study, but the barrier was the enormous complexity of human biology. And that could be viewed in three different contexts. And I state these in contemporary terms. I did think about them, but not quite the same way I'm going to tell them to you. So the first was a realization that the complexity of human biology could only be deciphered by generating a lot of data from each individual that allowed us to survey them and their systems and their integrations and then make assessments about health. And what was also evident at that time is that you had to be able to do a search of internal complexities as well as external complexities and formulated the idea that the blood is a window into health and disease. And the simple idea, which we'll mention a little bit later, is that blood bathes all organs, they secrete molecules into the blood, and if you can read where those molecules come from, you can make assessments about the status of those organs. We'll talk about organ-specific blood proteins and how we've done that in a number of different contexts. And of course, the third area was, let's generate all of this data, what do we do with it? It's an enormous amount of data, and that kind of thinking led to what later became systems biology, the idea that you could take this enormous amount of digital information from the individual, and you could map it into biological networks that underpinned normal and disease physiology, and if you looked at the dynamics of those networks, you could get enormous insights into wellness and a disease. Anyway, it was that kind of thinking then that led me to uh, a career where I participated uh, over the next 50 years in seven paradigm changes. And each of those paradigm changes, on the one hand, was a powerful tool for deciphering human complexity. On the other hand, they were stakes in the ground for what you needed to do to optimize health care in the future. So let me run through uh, the uh, paradigm changes. Initially, when I started at Caltech, I set up a lab that became very cross-disciplinary, and we developed over the next 20-ish years six instruments that allowed you to read and write DNA. And the key instrument in this context was automated DNA sequencing because it was that instrument that made it possible uh, to think about doing the Human Genome Project for the first time. In the spring of 1985, I got me invited uh, by the Department of Energy to come to the first meeting ever held on the Human Genome Project. And 12 of us went and came to the conclusion, one, it was feasible, and two, we were split six to six on whether it was a good or a bad idea. Those opposed, opposed because of big science and the fear that it would engulf all of the traditional science at that time, the smaller science, and of course that didn't happen. 
Now, a third thing that happened that was really interesting kind of in the sociologic context of the university is the division of biology at Caltech really disliked the idea that I was working on all these different technologies, proteins, nucleic acids, and so forth. And they argued to my chairman that I be moved to engineering, who fortunately refused to do that. But it underpinned an idea that divisions of biology at that time had a very narrow focus. And that was further confirmed when I got very involved in the Human Genome Project. And the senior faculty at Caltech were uniformly uh, against the Human Genome Project. And Caltech, a really outstanding university, don't get me wrong, biology missed out completely on the Genome Project, which I think was really a tragedy for any institution that was so poised to take advantage of it at that time. But anyway, uh, I ended up deciding, one, because they weren't interested in technology, and two, they weren't interested in, in uh, uh, the, the whole idea of, of uh, pushing forward with the Genome Project and everything. That with the help of Bill Gates, I went to uh, University of Washington, and there set up the first cross-disciplinary department of of uh, biology, and it was enormously successful in the eight years that I was there. And what happened toward the end is I'd always wanted to superimpose systems biology, systems thinking on top of this cross-disciplinary department, but I found in a big state university that the bureaucracy was utterly intolerable to really unconventional new kinds of ideas. And in fact, something I'll talk about later is I'm totally convinced if you have any original new idea, it can never successfully be born out of a pre-existing bureaucracy honed by the past and just barely able to deal with the present. That, that sounds, uh, but it's, it's true and it's really been true for every single one of these paradigm changes we've talked about. In all cases, they were enabled by new organizations that had a completely fresh new view of the opportunities that lay before them. So in 2010, I moved to start the Institute of Systems Biology uh, in Seattle, and we pioneered the kinds of things we'll talk about in just a few moments. And in... Uh, about 2000, I started thinking more broadly about healthcare and came to the conclusion it should be P4, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And the first three Ps are all about science, and we really know how to do science now. The fourth P, and I'll talk about this at the end, participatory, is all about persuading people to change how they think about doing healthcare. And that is the most difficult challenge by far. And we're only partially in a position to do it really effectively. But we'll talk more about that later. Now, I was able, in, from 2006 to 2011, to persuade Luxembourg, the state of Luxembourg, to give ISB $100, uh, $100 million dollars to invent the new technologies of P4 medicine. And that enabled us in 2014 to begin doing then the first population studies of individuals using the deep data of the phenome and of the genome. That's what this entire lecture is all about. And of course, that advanced to the company called Aerofail that Jennifer Lovejoy will talk about in enormous detail. The important point was we, over four years, gathered 5,000 patients and had genome, phenome data on all of them. And that data and its analysis have absolutely transformed and convict, convinced us that in the next 10 years to 15 years, we should be in a position to affect this radical change that we've actually talked about. And then, as I said, in 2021, we started Phenome Health. 
And the initiative there, the Human Phenome Initiative, one of its objectives is to have a second genome project, a million people, we study them over 10 years with genome phenome analyses, and that will catalyze and validate entirely the data-driven view of, of, uh, of the potential for healthcare, and we'll talk about that again in uh, some detail. Now, one thing I can say is, again, every one of those paradigm changes had to be born out of a new organizational structure, and I actually created five for-profit companies, and uh, uh, or four for-profit companies and five nonprofits to do this. And the other thing that I learned in doing these things is, in the beginning, if you have new ideas, Almost all scientists reflexly reject them. 80% of the biologists in, at uh, the US were opposed to the Genome Project, and NIH was opposed up until the very, very end. And they jumped in at the end because it was obvious it was going to happen and everything, and did, did a reasonable job. Not a good job, but a reasonable job. So. Anyway, let me talk now a little bit about uh, health and what health is all about. So if I had to pick out one feature of what we can optimize with regard to humans, it would be health. Because health underpins all that is intrinsically good and effective about individuals. And that's early development, that's education, that's jobs, that's community, it's creativity, it's happiness, it's a whole variety of different things. And of course, what it ultimately does is it expands the health span. And that's, that is the number of years that you're healthy in body and mind and able to be productive and creative. And a really interesting question to ask yourself is, what do you want to do if we can give you 20 extra years of healthy, creative uh, life? And most people have not thought about that. And we should start bringing this to uh, the education of kids. And we have a program that's doing that that I'll mention uh, at the end. Uh, but Health, I think, is absolutely critical to what we're talking about. And the data-driven aspect of it, of course, has to do with determining the whole genome sequence of an individual, which gives each individual the potential health trajectories that they can carry out. And the actual course of those health trajectories is determined by the features that govern how your phenotype changes over time from birth to, uh, to death and so forth. And the two big factors that, that modify phenotype are one, your behavior, because in the end, you're the conductor of your own health and how much effort you put into it is absolutely specified by you. And then number two, your environment has an enormous impact. And, we're coming to understand more and more about subtle impacts that are really important. And of course, we have ways of assaying all of these different kinds of things. We can look at blood analytes, we can look at the gut microbiome, we can look at digital uh, measurements of brain health and body health and, and uh, patient reported records and electronic health records and, and the beam. And as I said earlier, what is really going to be critical in this in the future is this second genome project, a million people who will validate the power of data-driven health. We'll show you exactly what that means in just a moment. Now, systems biology is really central to being able to assess the individual. And of course, that's true because as we said earlier, blood is a window into health and disease. It generates an enormous amount of digital information. And of course, that information can be mapped into the dynamical biological networks, disease perturbed networks, and so forth to understand the underpinning 
biochemistry and physiology and so forth. And of course, this gives us then the ability to use the tools of AI, knowledge graphs and digital twins and large language models, to deal with the genome-phenome complexity in a way it's never been possible before. And again, at the end of the lecture, we'll talk explicitly what I mean by that. And of course, the essence of systems biology or these features indicated here, it's holistic, it's global, it's dynamical, it's hierarchical, and, and so forth. And, and the temporal dynamics of the phenome is the most important single thing in being able to decipher complexity, as, as one knows from uh, dynamical theory and so forth. Now, this leads us to a conviction that we each have a health trajectory, and that health trajectory has three components. It's wellness, it's the earliest transition from wellness to disease, and then it's the progression of disease, and then you can repeat the, the whole cycle. We now have the ability in two different ways to predict very, very early disease, much earlier than 98% of the biomarkers you've heard about in biology today. And what that gives us the potential to do then is reverse disease at its earliest state when it's actually simple. We've looked at uh, a mouse model for neurodegeneration and a mouse model for cancer that we can induce. And we've looked at an individual person in an, all three of those cases shown that from the point of induction, there's an exponential increase in disease-perturbed networks such that by the time you get to most clinically diagnosable diseases, you have enormous complexity. And largely what pharma does these days is generate these nice targeted drugs that hit symptoms but don't hit causes. Chronic diseases don't get reversed by uh, a single drug in any way. They're going to have to have multimodal therapies in the possible. So again, health has these three features, uh, wellness, transition, and disease. And we can really optimize wellness well beyond what ordinary people have in their wellness. We can identify the earliest transitions to think about reversing them and beginning to cause a striking decline in chronic disease, which is going to be very important. And finally, you can use uh, precision medicine tools to deal with disease. But if it's diagnosed already, it's probably too complex to do uh, more than uh, ameliorate symptoms and things like that. And of course, this leads to the biggest paradigm change we've talked about, the idea of wellness and prevention uh, as contrast contrasted with uh, a disease-oriented uh, entity. Now, the validation of uh, this data-driven approach, I think, has very much come out of Airveil and the things that Jennifer will talk about in a few moments. And what I'll do is just make a few high-level comments about Airveil, and then we'll go through six examples of where we've taken data to absolutely be able to, to generate new actionable possibilities to uh, increase people's uh, health and so forth. So um, the uh, data that we're analyzing in Aravail are whole genome analyses, blood analytes, proteins, and clinical chemistries, and, and uh, metabolites, and so forth. Uh, the gut microbiome, of course. And then digital health, we used a Fitbit. And this led to, uh, through the integration of data, to the generation of, uh, of the order of 200 or so actionable possibilities, each of which if appropriate for a given individual, if executed, would improve wellness or let one uh, avoid disease. And coaches played a really important role in this whole process. And again, Jennifer will delineate that. From these 5,000 patients have come more than 25 papers. 
each spotlight an aspect of wellness or prevention. And I'll talk about six of these, uh, these aspects. So in the first case, uh, scientific wellness and actionable possibilities arose from the fact that we could look at the uh, six different types of data uh, from, and initially we did it on the first hundred and some individuals, and we were able to create a statistical wheel that correlated more than 3,500 different data points in uh, different uh, data types. And the correlation of interesting data types led us to the literature and led us to the validation of actionable possibilities that could actually increase wellness and so forth. And one of the things about the Human Genome Project is that we estimate that uh, we'll have a million, um, a minimum of 10,000 new actionable possibilities. And my guess is the number is going to become very much closer to 50,000 actionable possibilities. Each features that can improve health, and it absolutely is going to demand AI to be able to deliver it in a rational way to physicians to be able to execute this, and we'll, we'll talk about that at a later point in time. Now, the other thing you can do with the uh, 1800 statistical correlations I talked about is something called community analysis, where essentially you, you take the hairball of all these statistical correlations and you start clipping away the edges that have the lowest probability to focus on domains of closely interacting analytes or features or genetic variants or whatever it is. And what was really striking about that data is when we did so, it turned out that there were about 70 distinct communities and they correlated beautifully with physiologic features or pathologic features. And in fact, one example is the cholesterol community that is exploding out in the middle here. That is, there are of the order of uh, 13 different components that are in interacting with uh, LDL cholesterol. And the important point here is we made the observation that thyroxin has a beautiful negative correlation with LDL cholesterol. We made the hypothesis this would be a terrific drug to start. And then we went to the literature and found Lilly was well along with thyroxin in creating the drug against LDL cholesterol. But the other important point that I think was absolutely fascinating is with 500 proteins, we got 3,500 uh, correlations. We then went back and used the same 100 people to look at 5,000 proteins, 10 times as many, and that gave us 35,000 correlations and an enormously large number of communities. And what was absolutely fascinating is communities started to fuse into one another, giving you insights into the interactions of the complex physiology that we didn't know were interrelated in some ways and leading to a whole host of potential new drug targets. So this is an area of drug discovery uh, that has not been approached at all. Now, another thing we can do with data-driven health is deal with this problem. And this was a paper in Nature about five, six years ago that looked at the 10 top drugs in the US today and asked the question, what fraction of the individuals actually responded effectively to the drugs. <clears throat> and the overall average was just under 10%. And in fact, for some drugs, it was one in 25 that actually responded. So people are getting enormous numbers of relatively toxic and relatively expensive drugs that they needn't do, and that's $600 billion worth of money. We think we can get beautiful biomarkers that will identify the responsive individuals for all the major drugs in the course of the study for the million person project. And that means you can save 90% of your drug costs and you're talking about half a trillion dollars in that regard. And that's just the beginning of 
what we can do, and we'll talk about uh, the second thing we can do now. And that's the idea that we have this beautiful ability with phenomics to detect the earliest stage of chronic disease. And this all began with a woman in Aravel called Eve that was diagnosed about three years into her uh, into, into her uh, progression in the studies with stage four pancreatic cancer, which is a grim diagnosis indeed. And what we did was went back and looked at blood draws that were six months apart prior to the time she had the clinical diagnosis. And we were able to show roughly for uh, two years ahead that you could see a set of proteins strikingly elevated in Eve as compared with the general population. And at least three of the five proteins map beautifully into disease perturbed networks relative to stage four pancreatic cancer. So what that meant is we had the potential for getting biomarkers years ahead of time could begin to fix things before they progressed actually to a clinically storable disease. Now in Aravale, 167 such wellness to disease transitions occurred. 35 uh, occurred in cancer. We looked at nine additional cancer transitions and basically found exactly the same things before. And with the million person project, we feel we'll be able to uh, estimate 200,000 transitions and that'll give us good statistics for the transition points for virtually all uh, chronic kinds of uh, diseases. And the really key point is, at least in the United States, 86% of the healthcare dollars are spent on chronic diseases. And imagine what you could do if you, in a 10-year period, could eliminate either a third or half of the chronic diseases using these kind of strategies in the future. You'd be talking about trillions of dollars of savings. And these are dollars that, if they're engineered right, could go into wellness and prevention. And I'll talk to you later about how we might engineer them so they could be done in a correct fashion. And this is, this is basically the study we did on Eve. We took nine disease perturbed networks common to stage four pancreatic cancer, and then we looked at each of the four blood draws she had prior to clinical diagnosis and showed in the earliest blood draw, no networks were perturbed. In the second one, one was, in the third one, two were, and in the fourth one, uh, five were. So there was kind of, again, this exponential increase in complexity to the point when you got to diagnosis of the disease, you weren't going to be able to deal with it in a simple fashion at all. The other point, we found one marker that was characteristic only of diseases that had undergone metastatic transformation. So in looking at these kinds of markers, there are all sorts of features and dimensions you could begin to think about. And finally, one thing we started exploring is the idea of organ-specific markers. In the brain, there are of the order of seven or 800 of them. Only a few of those actually go out into the blood to serve as reporters for the brain. Until you have brain disease, you lose your, your, your brain uh, uh, conductivity, and proteins that are site-specific can leak out from wherever you've lost the, the uh, conductivity in the brain. And hence, it gives you a clue to the kind of disease exists in the brain and so forth. And we've done the same for placenta, and uh, there are 37 placental-specific proteins. They're actually localized to diff different aspects of the placenta, and we're using those now in clinical studies of pregnancy to uh, look at interesting features of, uh, of birth and development uh, in pregnancy. We can also use uh, polygenic scores as a means for identifying people that are poised to 
transition disease. I remember in, in 1918, when from the British Biobank, these wonderful studies of polygenic scores came out where they classified patients with regard to genetic risk and then with regard to clinical features on the y-axis. And what you were able to see in the four representative ones we have here, atrial fibrillation, a cancer, and so forth, is that as the genetic risk increased, the number of clinical features you could see increased. And a really interesting question was poised then, and that was, if we looked at these same individuals mapped according to genetic risk, what would be the nature of the analytes that would be abnormally expressed in the context of that genetic risk? And we did a study in this regard on 54 polygenic scores. We looked at 856 different analytes, and we were able to show beautifully in every single case there were multiple examples of analytes that generally tended to trend up or to trend down uh, in these uh, different stages and so forth. And we'll talk about some specific ones in just a moment. What was really fascinating about these diseases is the analytes that tended to tend up and become very high were in cases where we knew something about the disease, exactly the analytes that were overexpressed in individuals that had transitioned to disease. So these people with high genetic risk and high levels of relevant analytes are poised, ready to make that transition. So we would argue this is going to be another very powerful means. Here's an example of half cysteine uh, decreasing in IBD, and the reason that's interesting is it's a fundamental component in synthesizing an oxidizing kind of compound, and of course, an IBD, oxidative stress, is a major component of it. So it makes you wonder, could you treat this, at least in part, uh, inversely to the way we treat LDL cholesterol, namely increase it, and get it back to normal, and that hasn't been that hasn't been tested in humans. It has been tested in animal model system in interesting ways, and it suggests it's right. Now, for LDL cholesterol, and in those individuals that weren't on statins, you saw a nice linearly increase in LDL cholesterol. And what really was obvious with this is if you had a high genetic risk for LDL cholesterol and you had high cholesterol, the only thing that could bring it down were statins or chemical chemistry. Whereas if you were at low risk for cholesterol and you had high LDL cholesterol, diet and exercise brought it down beautifully. And the important point here is high and low genetic risk people for given diseases are going to be treated very differently, and we need to have physicians aware of that kind of fact. Now, the other interesting question is, if we go to the people that are very high genetic risk, what does the LDL cholesterol look at in the developmental form? And we have an NF1 answer to that. I had a colleague whose father, grandfather, and great-grandfather died before 50 or so uh, of uh, heart attacks, and he was obviously very, very susceptible. So what he started to do was to take his LDL cholesterol in his teens, and it followed a remarkable course. It was totally normal up into the mid-30s, and then it shot up suddenly. His weight didn't change, his diet didn't change, he did a lot of exercises. There was an intrinsic change that occurred that shot the LDL cholesterol up. The only thing that brought it down were statins. So again, he fell in that category. But suppose we could see that dramatic kind of tr uh, transition, and then, as we did for the others, do the preventive kinds of awards. So one... Two take-home lessons then from this, I think, are one, 
we ought to treat high and low risk people in different ways. And two, the upper five to 10% of the high risk people ought to be viewed as people very close to transitions if their analytes reflect the analytes of the disease process. So, uh, okay, a healthy aging and health span. One of the experiments we could do that was absolutely fascinating has been individuals into 10-year categories since they range from 21 to 93, and then ask, what kind of control do they have over the expression of the three blood analytes we measured, proteins, metabolites, and clinical chemistries? And what was true in a beautiful linear fashion is as you got older, you increasingly, on the average, lost control of uh, a confined expression of these kinds of analytes. But what was really interesting and relevant is there were some old people that still contained very narrow bandwidths and so forth. And this led to the idea that we could create an algorithm for biological age, the age your body says you are, that could then assess beautifully, essentially, wellness. So we did this. We did all of the analyte individuals. We showed that women in this wellness program lost 1.5 years of biological age per year. Uh, they were in the program, and men lost 0.8 years. And this is really a striking question of how far down can we push these things. So my biological age, when last measured, was about 15 years younger than my chronologic age. And the further you push it down, the better you are at aging. And the algorithm we've developed here gives you clues as how to optimize your global biological age, but it also lets us measure the biological age of individual major organs and see if they need to be enhanced. And it makes suggestions about how you can you can do that, that, that kind of uh, thing as well. The other thing that was really interesting is we looked at 44 diseases, and for every one of them, the average biological age of people with, uh, with a disease was greater than their chronologic age. So it is really a metric for wellness of a very interesting type, and we're going to be using it in the studies that we'll be talking about shortly. Uh, so the penultimate example I'll give you is metabolic BMI, and this is something that Noah Rappaport has done in really a quite a spectacular fashion. So the conventional BMI, height and weight kind of measurements, is enormously uh, non-responsive to metabolic changes. It misdiagnoses 30% of the people uh, it, uh, it does a pretty good job of assessing chronic diseases and things like that. But uh, it, it certainly mis misclassifies, for example, athletes. Heavily muscled are almost always seen as obese types of individuals. What Noah did was use metabolites to figure out an equivalent type of uh, BMI uh, measurement and she was able to show enormous flexibility, the ability to strata, for example, obese people into biologically relevant populations, both with regard to biomarkers and some of the new drugs that have come out. She showed that there was 10% of the population that were absolutely maladapted metabolically that were totally missed by the old BMI. So in many ways, it's going to be a powerful tool for assessing wellness again in the future. And the final thing I'll talk about is brain health. Michael Mersenich has pioneered with a company called Profit uh, the ability to assess 25 different cognitive features and to actually optimize features that have lost their effectiveness. And what he was able to show very beautifully is the average person with regard to cognitive features 
rises to a maximum in the mid-30s and then gradually fades away. And that's because you don't know the kind of exercise that the brain needs to keep, it, keep its cognitive features going. And it isn't just being a scientist can keep you effective. You have to go beyond that. Uh, and what he was also able to show is if he took about 1,000 people in their 80s, the majority of them actually could be come back to early mid-age form, indicating that the brain is enormously flexible in its adaptiveness if you've not lost neurons and so forth. So we think that this whole question of brain health is really going to be an absolutely critical feature in the future, and it's something we're pushing uh, very, very hard. So, um, uh, in, so let me make an argument now that there are two types of health. One is what I call classic health, which is the conventional things, diet, exercise, uh, sleep, uh, stress, and, and the like. And the other is this data-driven type of assessment. And the big idea to realize is that phenomics and genomics gives you the ability to identify the defects that are reflected in your genome and identify the defects that are reflected in your phenome and to correct them. And that's an enormous dimensionality beyond just traditional kind of wellness. So, for example, in the uh, genome, there are seven categories of, of uh, actionable clinical possibilities that we'll be able to look at in the future. In the phenome, there are hundreds. We're just beginning to look at them now. And of course, data-driven health can actually optimize exercise for an individual, uh, as well as diet for an individual and so forth. But this other point that I talked about is the idea of being able to take ordinary wellness and what we can get out of that and then add to that brain, uh, uh, data-driven brain health. And what we can show are enormous extensions that go for the genome, for the, uh, the, the various analytes that we can measure in the phenome and so forth. And we extend enormously in all of those different dimensions the actionable possibilities we can get. And of course, you can define for the individual what those things are and very clearly prioritize them with regard to actionable possibilities. Now again, the Million Person Project will give us tens of thousands of actionable possibilities and we'll need AI to be able to deliver those appropriately to physicians. So the Human Phenome Initiative, which we're talking about now, is going to use of the order of 10 times more data, generate 10 times more data than Arafail did. And I won't go into all of the details of that. We've put together a platform that starts with uh, education and recruitment of patients. We have a biobank to which samples come and from which they're sent to vendors to carry out uh, genomic and phenomic kinds of data. We don't do the data ourselves. We're just on the analytic end of things. We've created a computational multi-omic platform that's very powerful that allows us to bin separate types of data and integrate them together beautifully in differing combinations and so forth. And these platforms, this platform, we're going to make available to partners that will be trying to generate and so forth. And this, of course, leads to lots of new actionable possibility. It leads to spin-off companies that can come out of this, uh, increase medical knowledge and, and the opportunity to license out really interesting intellectual property. And we have a whole series of partners. We've combined with the Buck to partner on the critical process of aging. They look at aging from the point of view of the 12 hallmarks of aging and how to optimize each of those to improve aging. We look at aging from the point of view of scientific wellness. 
which we think can give even, even bigger increases in uh, effective aging, but bringing them together is going to be very powerful. We have a partner, Guardian Research Network, which has access to 50 million patients in the South and Southeast, 13 different states, all have really nice electronic health records, and, and they lie across Latino and African American populations that will give us the racial diversity we need. We uh, are collaborating with Posit on brain health that I've described. Google, we're collaborating using their large language model, MedPalm, to, to do work that I'll describe in uh, just a few moments and, and so forth. So the Phenome Initiative then has three short-term aims. So one is the idea that we actually will carry out an Airville-like program that's uh, universal in the states and maybe universal in the world at one point in time, and that's uh, one interesting thing that we could talk about. And we've already got people in major healthcare systems and Saudi Arabia and the UAE interested in this kind of possibility. A second possibility that we're actually starting on this quarter is uh, looking at the four major chronic diseases that uh, uh, lead to a staggering fraction of the chronic disease uh, costs and so forth, beginning with diabetes and so forth. So, uh, and that's in part what we're here to talk about, particularly from the point of view of selected cohorts from long-term biobanks that have samples that can be analyzed in the multi-omic uh, uh, context to add to the clinical analyses that, uh, that you here in Finland have done so very well. And then the uh, other point that I would make that I think is, is really important about the um, about the big data approach to chronic diseases is I think it'll really transform how we think about these chronic diseases. So the approach we've taken with diabetes is to look at 10 million electronic health records and ask of the clinical features, one, can we define people at the three different stages of diabetes, early, middle, and late, uh, and number two, is there any hint that there are different subtypes and subclasses there and transitions from those uh, as, as well? And then we're also really going to be very interested in uh, moving to cohorts that come from the data banks, and we have one from uh, collaborators in Toronto called PREVENT that have looked over 15 years at diabetes once roughly every three years with enormous clinical information. And now that uh, those blood samples can be converted into multi-omic analyses. And they can be used then to drive the insights that'll come from a large thousand person person selected from the electronic health records and analyzed in principle over a period of four years. We've got the first year of funding for doing that right now, and we're getting that actually started. But it's here where we'll be able to define with enormous precision subtypes and look at the transitions from each subtype to major pathologic features, uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, macular degeneration, limb amputation, uh, and, and the like. And of course, adding all of these things together gives us an ideal position then to think in an interventional sense about uh, looking, coming to understand the response to drugs, the response to multimodal therapies, and, and, and the like. And of course, what this means is for all of the chronic diseases, we're going to be able to stratify them into subtypes and clearly the subtypes are going to need drugs that will specifically target them. And I think the big challenge is 
as we start to convert chronic diseases and the subtypes, the current procedure using small molecules or antibodies for generating drugs is way too expensive and way too slow. And so a number of us uh, in Sweden and at ISB have put together a company called P4 Bios, which can generate at 10 to the 12 levels diverse peptides, 20, 30 MERS, that can be placed individually in viruses, and the viruses can individually f f select, infect human cells and be selected in the context of that enormously large 10 to the 12 scales to say, do you have drugs that, for example, present, prevent uh, COVID-19 infection in these cell types? And I think it's going to take a whole new type of drug company that can do things at that scale that is going to be necessary to treat the new therapeutic opportunities that are going to arise from uh, intervening for the genomic and phenomic features we'll be able to discover uh, in the future. And of course, from the IA point of view, what we really are doing now is taking the genome and phenome data from individual patients and on the one hand, placing it in knowledge graphs, uh, which tie together all of the information and knowledge in PubMeds about all the major features of uh, normal physiology and disease physiology, or on the other hand, uh, gener turn them into digital twins, which have homeostasis for Norman normal features against which each individual can be compared to see where they fall deficient and to make recommendations about how to convert them back to homeostasis. And that's, we have a, a, a brain health digital twin that does this remarkably well, and we've modeled it against uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and it looks really absolutely fascinating. And of course, both of these can then be fed into large language models where you can take an enormous amount of data and then begin classified in appropriate fashion. And of course, what we see coming from this in the million person project, or even some of the smaller projects we're looking at now, is the ability to get thousands of different actionable possibilities that can be prioritized for each individual in the context of all the diseases across the spectrum of medicine. That is a partnership between physicians and the AI device will create a super expert physician for all domains of medicine that has the ability to treat patients like they've never been treated before. And of course, there are lots of questions and psychology and so forth you have to ask. But the potential of having for every doctor access to optimal treatment for their patient, I think is one of the really exciting things that's coming out of AI here. On the education thing, as I said before, the first three Ps are all about science and the fourth P is all about psychology and sociology and, and economics and and, uh, and education and so forth. We've just, uh, are publishing a textbook on systems biology and systems medicine that we think will ideal for uh, medical schools if they ever think about taking it up. But nursing schools are much more open to taking on new kinds of courses. So that's, maybe the nurses will lead the physicians in an appropriate way here. We've taken uh, the two chapters on systems medicine and P4 medicine, and we've converted them into a year-long course for uh, 11th and 12th graders. That over, and we've tested in Ballard High School for the last two and a half years, and it had spectacular success. 
And these kids come out knowing more about the future of medicine than 98% of the doctors in the U.S. And teaching at that age is exactly where we ought to be educating our systems to think about the opportunities of data-driven health in the future. We've generated a partnership with Scientific American. They published for us the new science of wellness, which has about eight articles that describe that in very general details that, that uh, high school kids can read and enjoy, teachers read it and enjoy it. And we're doing another one right now with uh, healthy aging and health span. And then finally, we're thinking about a 60-minute documentary movie looking at the last 5,000 years of wellness and the major features that have changed across that period of time. And it's absolutely a fascinating kind of subject, ending up, of course, with uh, the revolution uh, in data-driven science and things like that. I have published a book that has talked about many of the features we've discussed here, and we recently published a nature genetics review that talk about this revolution from the genome to the phenome, which is not from two, it's really the integration of uh, the two together and everything. So um, if you look at the five major challenges in uh, the US anyway, namely the quality of health care, and we're at the bottom of the top 20, even though we spend three or four times as much as the next uh, country per patient and so forth. The, the vast increase in the aging population, the explosion of chronic diseases, uh, racial uh, diversity is really essential, and, and of course the exponentially increasing costs. John Bell, who many of you may know, uh, 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 a real pioneer in, in personalized medicine in the UK has made the statement that any system which focuses only on disease-oriented healthcare is intrinsically unstable and will never uh, survive long time, basically. And I absolutely believe that statement. And of course, what's really interesting, of course, is that... Uh, the Million Person Project will answer virtually all of those challenges in a compelling way and provide the statistics and the data to begin arguing we really need to make the change just as soon as, uh, as possible. So um, uh, what are going to come from this? Uh, wellness and prevention as opposed to disease. I think one of the things that the uh, that Million Person Project will do is generate a technology which will drive data-driven health into the home mediated by the cell phone. And of course, if it does that, then we can think about exporting this to developed countries and globally having uh, uh, all of these different things. And of course, AI is going to be absolutely transformational. We've got many superb people in phenome health that have done a lot of work, and you'll hear from Jennifer Lovejoy uh, next uh, in this regard. So thank you very much for your attention.